highlighting that. So tonight our presenter uh, actually presented to culinary historians back in November on Appalachia. 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 <laughs> Did I say it right? You got it. Oh, good. Because I, I get in trouble sometimes, you know? I don't have to throw an apple at you, so we're you doing You don't fine. have to do that for me. Uh, when and where is the program in Flora and Fauna? I will send uh, send you information. Um, so Susie got Segare. It's a great name to pronounce. Great name to pronounce. Um, she's author, chef, fiddler, forager, and hails from Madison County, North Carolina, in the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains, a certified cul culinary professional and certified specialist of wine with a diploma in gastronomy and taste from the Cordon Bleu and University de Rems. I hope I pronounced that. Susie is the founder and director of the Seasonal School of Culinary Arts, which convenes four times a year in Asheville, um, Ithaca, Sonoma and Paris. Wow. Susie also orchestrates a series of wine dinners known as the Asheville Wine Experience, the yearly gustatory, gustatory extravaganza, the Asheville Truffle Experience, which is going to be next month, I believe, and a series of foraging, cooking, dining events called the Appalachian Culinary Experience. Um, and her book on truffles, A Chef's Guide, is what she's going to talk about tonight. And this is one of those things that it came out during the um, pandemic. So it didn't quite get the, um, it didn't quite get the uh, push that, that it needed. I'm sure it's fine, but, you know, we'll help to push it a little further along. So Susie, take it over. Thank you so much, Kathy, and good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year to you all. I can't believe we are already in 2023, and it's a pleasure to be uh, around the table with you or wherever you might be in your kitchens across the country, a lot in Chicago, I imagine, since uh, that's where your two organizations are based. But I know that there are a few who have dialed in from North Carolina and New York and uh, various other reaches, so welcome, everybody. It's a vast subject, and I had the pleasure today of receiving the arrival of a couple of truffles since I'm doing a private dinner later on this week, and I'm just going to bring one out and show it to you straight off the bat. Let's see. Um, I'm seeing you. Let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm just playing with my screen a second here because... Um, I'm not quite seeing <laughs> what's happening. <laughs> oh, well, you know, uh, I imagine... I imagine we're there somewhere. Um, huh, speaker. Okay, I see you, Kathy. Um, here's what we're talking about. So how many of you, I know I cannot see your responses, but um, I'm sure a lot of you have been introduced to the truffle. This is about, it's almost two ounces of the tuber melanosporum, which is my all time favorite variety there being many, many, many different varieties um, of truffle. So this is a little bit more than walnut size, as you see, it's about egg size for two ounces. And oh, the smell, it's just amazing. I hope I'm making you drool right now. <laughs> it smells, to me, it smells like molasses. It smells like um, all the deep, dark, uh, interior of the earth and the woods and um, olives and chocolate and the richest reddest of wines with a bit of tannins but also a bit of sweetness and it just changed my life when I ran across these uh, tubers for the first time. So I'm going to close up this jar because right now what I have these guys doing is working for me. As, as soon as they arrived, I've put them in a jar with eggs. I've put others in a jar with butter so that they are perfuming the eggs, perfuming the butter. I could put them in a jar with cream. I could put them in a jar with chocolate. And then you can eat those ingredients and really not even have to use your truffle. You can use a little bit of extra for effect, but you want to make your truffle work for you first thing when you get it. 
So I'm getting ahead of myself here. I just wanted to share that with you because I'm so excited about this, these truffles arriving today. And I will add that these truffles were grown in North Carolina. So that is a relatively recent uh, venture. Um, it's just been a couple of decades that that truffles have started to take root, so to speak, in the southeast of the, the U.S. Uh, the northwest of the U.S. has various species that are native to the region, and they have a bit more truffle history than we do here in the southeast, but we are catching up with them. And there have been truffles discovered uh, relatively recently, um, well, actually a little more than relatively recently, but they've come into our consciousness relatively recently. The Appalachian truffle and the Blue Ridge truffle specifically, and the pecan truffle that are a native to this region as well. So I'm just going to show you this book cover. This is Field Guide to North American Truffles, and it's written by Dr. Jim Trappy and a couple of his colleagues. So this, this, I, yeah, I don't, I think you can see this. This book has uh, 90 different species that are indigenous to the U.S., and of course there are more being discovered you know, as time goes by. But this is a really, really good resource if you're interested in the scientific component of truffles. And it has uh, fantastic photos too of the, the truffle itself in its round form uh, and also a cross section so you can see what the veining looks like, which is different in different species of truffles. So I'm gonna go from that technical uh, jump in to a little bit of the mystery that surrounds truffles because as uh, my friend Tom Michaels who uh, is known for his Tennessee truffles just over the border from me in East Tennessee says that truffle growing is uh, a combination of history and mystery but it's really mostly mystery. So I'm going to share with you a, a little bit of the introduction here which uh, will give you an idea what, of what drew me into this lore. It was in 2007 that I fell deeply and irrevocably in love with truffles. The month was January, as it is now, and a chilly mistral swept, swept over the soft gray curves of a wintry Provence, carrying with it the scent of wild rosemary and thyme and the tang of wood smoke rising from kitchen fires fed by sarmon discarded grapevines left over from orchard trim. I had made the trek by train from Paris, an hour north of my then home in the Loire, speeding through fields of winter wheat, past pastures inhabited by Charolais, the prized beef cattle from central and southeastern France, towards towering remains of medieval castles, long abandoned by their lords and ladies, past village after village, each one clustered around an ancient church built out of stone and faith. The Clos d'Allerie is where I landed, ferried from the railway station in the dark of night by a tall slender figure of Natalie and her teckle spaniel, Ubu. The vehicle was an old farm truck and it rattled and shook like any good working companion. It smelled like dogs and saucisson and something else dark and dusky, musky and chanting. That something else was truffles, specifically the Perigord truffle, Tuber melanosporum, that mysterious fungal beast also known by the moniker Black Gold, Black Diamond, Black Princess, French Black Winter Truffle, and Truffe du Perigord. Fruity, musky, floral, earthy, pungent, feral, elusive, captivating. Once it grabs your senses, you are lost or found forever. So I'll stop there with the reading because you can pick up a copy of this if you haven't already and uh, continue yourself. Uh, but I wanted to just bring you into that mysterious dark kind of tunnel. I, I want to show you this picture also. Speaking of dark mysterious tunnels, if you can see this, this is uh, the space between two rows of Tom Michael's truffle orchard when it was in its heyday. And this is a hazelnut uh, trees uh, serving as the hosts. So you see that that tunnel like mystery um, and uh, it really draws you in. It's not it, it's the physical part. It's the visual part. It's the scent and it's also the lore. So um, I would like to continue a little bit with a, with a little bit of truffle history because um, as 
many of you probably know, particularly you mycologists and folks who have studied truffles a little bit, truffles are nothing new to the world. The first known recording of the truffles existence made by Neo-Sumerians on clay tablets dates back to around 2000 BC, with the oldest surviving truffle recipes dating back to about 400 AD. Throughout more than 4,000 or so years since truffles were first recorded, their reputation as an elusive and untamable delicacy has caused their prices to soar to anywhere between 800 and 4,000 or more a pound. In 2005, a 1.2 kilo, kilo white truffle sold for 90,000 euros at an auction in Italy. And that's a whopping $41,262 per pound. So uh, let's see, are you getting, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that this, <laughs> this screen is not cooperating right now. Is this too light struck? I can turn off the light if that's too bright. Oh, Let me and there's know, a Kathy. cat. Yeah, there's uh, a cat. You, I think right you moved you my screen. You're, you're, I think your camera keeps reorienting. The, yeah, it's, like it's right my, now you go dark and then you go light. It's, it's the truffle cat. He's um, <laughs> casting a spell on me. So anyway, truffles, having been traced all the way back to the Stone Age, revered by humans and animals alike, there's a period of time around the Middle Ages when, due to an overly zealous church, um, their consumption was frowned upon. Um, as the church's power waned, however, in the Renaissance, the truffle, along with the appreciation of other fine things such as art and literature, uh, gained um, gained ground again. So. Um, that for just a wee little bit of history, I want to skip on to a bit of the science now. Um, truffles grow, as many of you may possibly already know, in symbiosis with a host tree. The microscopic fungal rootlets, or mycelium, join with the roots of the host tree to form bridges called mycorrhiza, through which the truffle fungus extracts minerals from the soil and shares them with the tree, while the tree feeds the fungus and sugars produce by its leaves through photosynthesis. Um, sorry, <laughs> cat distraction here. Uh, when fruiting occurs, the truffle ripens then until its aroma becomes potent enough to attract wild animals who would naturally dig it up and consume it, subsequently spreading its spores from, for propagation. So we humans don't have the uh, advantage of a dog's nose and we frequently will employ a dog or a pig to help us out. Uh, um, I wonder how many of you saw the movie Pig that was recently released. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun one. Uh, you should look that one up. Um, but more fun than that is um, the truffle, uh, let's see, what was it called? Um, <laughs> now I'm forgetting the, the name. There was, there was a truffle docu documentary that came out last year at this time, The Truffle Hunters. Uh, that one's a really, really fun film to watch. Uh, it, it takes you into the depth of the Italian woods and uh, into the Italian kitchens and the folks, the truffle hunters who live with their dogs, uh, take baths with their dogs. Their dogs climb up on their table and it's just part of their part of their lore. So that's a fun one to look up if you want to know a little bit more about truffle lore. Um, beyond the science, then there's a bit of the geography that, uh, that plays in. Uh, of the more than 200 varieties of truffles known to exist worldwide, and I've heard different figures from different people, but I think that's what Jim Trappy identified. Only a handful uh, are really cherished in the kitchen currently, Tuber melanosporum, uh, Tuber magnatum, which is the white Italian truffle. You may have heard of that as the, uh, the Alba truffle also. Tuber anconatum, um, these are, these are a few uh, that are cherished in the kitchen. Oregon has four native truffle species um, that are recognized for their culinary value. The tuber oregonensi, I think that is how it's pronounced, uh, which is the Oregon spring white truffle, tuber jibosum, the Oregon black truffle, lucangium carth. Susianum, uh, anybody who's a Latin aficionado, aficionado can correct me here, uh, and the Oregon brown truffle, uh, which is uh, not a tuber, but it's um, 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 delicious as well. And then, of course, we have tuber leonii, that's the pecan truffle that is um, we are finding in the south here in this area, and we're finding it often planted, um, uh, growing in orchards where tuber melanosporum has been intentionally planted, so sort of as a side benefit. Um, and then there are other varieties as well. There's the desert truffle, which can be found in the Mediterranean, Middle East, and North Africa. 
And of course, Italy and France and Croatia and various Balkan countries are, are known for growing truffles as, as well. In fact, a lot of the truffles that are sold on the French and Italian markets might have come from Croatia or some nearby country uh, and have been shipped to where they can get a better price for them. And China, of course, has its trouble to her indicum, which uh, you want to avoid if at all possible because it's much less pungent than the the uh, the truffles that people are growing intentionally, and um, it also can infect other orchards if you should happen to bring it into the midst. So you have to be a little bit careful with uh, with what truffles you introduce and what you do with them afterwards because um, they might affect somebody's crop. Um, so there's a note, uh, I'd like to share with you a note on seasonality here. Various different truffles come into ripeness at different times of the year. At this moment, we're lucky to have the Tuber Milanosporum, which is ripe generally from um, mid-November to mid-March, more or less, depending on your area and depending on the time of year. Um, and then there is the Tuber Borchii, the Bien or white truffle, which is just beginning to ripen. Here we have uh, an orchard in the east of the state, which produces, which is producing large quantities of this. And with luck, given a little bit more time, a lot of the restaurants in North Carolina may be able to carry these truffles. So the white truffle is a slightly different profile, and we'll get into that in a moment. The tuper estivum, which is the black summer truffle, um, is ripe from the beginning of May through the end of August, generally. And then the tuber uncanatum, the burgundy truffle, which is essentially the same, but it, it uh, produces in the fall, uh, uh, produces from September through December. Magnatum uh, produces from September or October through December, more or less. Um, and then, you, you want to think if you're pairing uh, foods with truffles, you want to think of what's in season at that time of year that pairs best with your truffle, um, because uh, obviously, you know, the foods that are surrounding you at the time the truffles are ripe are good options to um, to bring into your pantry. Um, and of course, there are um, the four, the magic four ingredients that really, really make a truffle sing, because Truly, you don't need all that much to make a truffle work for you. You uh, can take the very, very plainest of ingredients, rice, potatoes, eggs, cream, um, pasta, and that will set off a truffle more than, more than anything. Um, so in a way, this luxury item, uh, it pairs best with a poor man's food all of those uh, ingredients that I just mentioned with a little bit of fat thrown in because the fat uh, helps capture the aromas and then disperse it uh, um, in, the, uh, in the foods that you're, you're using to cook with. So I want to take just a little pause to sing you a song. And for those of you who attended the session two months ago, forgive me if you heard this already, Go take a break, pour yourself a cup of uh, or a glass of something or sing along because you'll find the words familiar. So I want to uh, sing this because this is a, a little encapsulation of what it takes to grow a truffle. And in a moment, we'll do a little encapsulation of what it takes to cook with a truffle. So I will say that the farmers who are the farmers, the, 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 the people who have uh, orchardists who have planted and are experimenting with truffles in this country, they've had quite a curve. Um, and I also want to mention at this point the North American Truffle Growers Association, NACA which uh, is an association that exists for anybody who wants to know a lot more about the technical aspects of growing truffles. Um, this association uh, is meant to help people exchange information and so that everybody doesn't have to start over from ground zero. And uh, it's thanks to them, the, a, lot of, a lot of the farmers um, and truffle growers uh, that are part of that organization that uh, uh, I've managed to piece together enough information to make a little bit of sense of it. So I always think that songs help you remember what's happening or what you're about to, uh, what, you, what you need to carry out. So here we go with a little bit of the truffle talking blues.
Now, if you want to grow a truffle, let me tell you where to start. This is really not a journey for the faint of heart. You gotta clear your fields, lime the soil, find a nursery man that's loyal. You gotta buy your seedlings, they ain't cheap. Space them right, but not too deep. Fence your orchard, water and weed, prune and coddle, protect from heat. Keep the skunks and the deer and the rabbits and groundhogs and moles from foraging habits. Train a dog to find the prize, if ever that happy day arrives. You gotta watch the ground for signs of burn. Pray that it's at last your turn. Protect from frost, court some chefs, bleed until you believe, until you've nothing left but faith and hope and endless scuffle. That, my friends, is how to grow a truffle. And you so wrote this yourself, right? Sorry about that? And you wrote this song yourself? Yeah, uh, talk, Talking Blues, that's in my family. <laughs> my daddy sang a lot of Talking Blues when I was growing up, so that just kind of spun itself out. Um, what, what I didn't mention was the liming the soil earlier, and that as far as uh, um, uh, cultivating truffles in our part of the world, particularly the tuber melanosporum, which requires a pH of somewhere between 6.8 and 8, uh, requires a lot of lime. And it's a many, many year process. So you might um, plant your seedlings, which uh, you, if you don't have the scientific know-how to get them already infected with, with uh, truffle mycelia, you've got to find a nurseryman who grows, uh, uh, grows truffle seedlings. And we've got several of them in our country, fortunately. Um, and then you prepare your soil. You've got to get out all the competing elements, all the competing roots from any of the nearby trees. Preferably you would uh, uh, tackle a, 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 a piece of ground that has been previously cleared, farmed perhaps, maybe an old tobacco field, an old tomato field, uh, so that the roots are already gone. Uh, make sure that you don't plant it too close to the edge of your woods so that there aren't competing fungi. And um, again, lots and lots of lime. Um, make sure that you're not in an area where there's too much shade, too much frost, that it's not too dry, that it's not too wet, that it's got enough sand so that the soil drains. Um, there's a whole series of uh, criteria. And then of course there are the host trees. So depending on the truffle that you're planting, uh, you would, um, court a different host tree. For the Oregon truffles, it's often the Douglas fir. For the Perigord truffle, it's often hazelnuts or oaks, particularly uh, various species that are um, native to France, but not necessarily native to here. And um, for the uh, um, for the truffles that are growing in the east of state, the state right now, the Bianchettis, uh, it's often often the Loblolly pine. So, um, you know, a little bit of experimentation. People are experimenting all the time with other host trees that might be native and that might be able to become more blight resistant, as in the case of the hazelnut, which um, is often plagued with the eastern filbert blight. So, um, it's it's a it's a long process. It can take anywhere from a couple years, if you're really 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 lucky, depending on the kind of truffle you're growing, to 10, 11, 12, or more years. And then, of course, when the truffle ripens, you've got to have a trained dog to help you find it, and then you got to know what to do with it, and you've got to market it ideally within about 10 days because a truffle does have a shelf life. And if you uh, don't get it to a chef in time, then all that growing is going to be wasted. So that's why I wrote this book, actually, because there's been so much work that's gone into uh, experimenting with growing truffles in the States. And so few people really know what to do with them because we don't have that in our culture. We haven't had the chance to experiment with cooking with truffles like uh, like some of the, 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 the folks in Italy or France might have had. And even then, uh, unless you're um, living in that area or growing them yourself, most people can't afford truffles. So um, when, you, when you do get a truffle, you really wanna uh, use it to its best advantage. 
So I want to uh, suggest a couple of recipes, if you are lucky enough to have a truffle, that are super easy. Um, of cookut is my favorite. That's a baked egg where you just put a little bit of butter in the bottom of your dish. You break in your egg, you grate a little truffle on, you pour in a little cream, you put it in your oven for about eight minutes, and then you bring it out when the yolk is still soft and the truffle has infused the egg. And preferably, this would be with a truffle that, uh, an egg that sat with a truffle overnight in the refrigerator, so it already tastes truffly. So it's just a simple, easy recipe. You can take, um, uh, parmesan and grate it and then grate a little bit of truffle in with the parmesan and make a little uh, little um, pile on a baking dish and uh, put that in the oven and it comes out as a little parmesan crisp so that's a great appetizer. Truffled grits are great if you're from the south. If you're from the north and you don't eat grits then I'm sorry for you but uh, truffled grits with butter are just divine and uh, uh, something you can do in just a few minutes. Gougere, which is a, a puff pastry, that's a that's a great vehicle for grating truffles in as well, great for appetizers. Aioli, of course, uh, you know, if you whip up a mayonnaise and then you grate some truffles in it, you might want to, might not want to put uh, garlic in that or at least not too much garlic because you don't want to fight with the, with the truffle flavor, but that's a good recipe as well. Um, creme anglaise, uh, to, to go with a dessert, a chocolatey dessert, uh, chocolate mousse with grated truffle in it. That's delightful. Eggnog, <laughs> there's another one for you. Uh, eggnog is, if you've got a truffle for that and lace it with a little bit of good bourbon, uh, makes, uh, it makes for happy campers. And then of course, there's the ultimate truffled truffles. So if you make chocolate truffles and you grate a little bit of, uh, of truffle into those chocolate truffles, uh, that's delightful. And um, so the, for, the, for the dessert items, I would not use a white truffle. I would use a black truffle because you don't want that garlicky profile. And that's something I haven't covered yet. Here, let me just um, uh, uh, look up this page here. Um, a, a bit about flavor profiles because the white truffles and the black truffles, although I'm generalizing a little bit here because each each truffle species has its own um, individuality, but in, in general the black truffles are earthy, musky, floral, sensuous, pungent, sexy, sweet, dark, dusky, oaky, nutty, and savory. And if you think of sorghum, olives, molasses, and chocolate, you get that flavor profile going. Those are things that you might have in your taste memory that um, that these truffles evoke. They pair well with bold red wines such as Bordeaux or Shiraz or Malbec. Um, they're best used in recipes featuring, featuring eggs, potatoes, rice, pasta, cream, and butter. And a gentle heat brings out uh, brings out the flavor in these. Whereas uh, if you're using white truffles, you want to avoid heat because the heat can kill the flavor. So white truffles are earthy, pungent, musky, garlicky, kind of petroly. You know, a little bit of that um, oil quality, oil as in petrol. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier today, Kathy. Um, this can sometimes maybe turn you off, but with the right host ingredient, it's it can be really wonderful. It's a sharper, spicier, heady, intense flavor. Um, think of garlic or shallots or Parmesan. Uh, these truffles pair well with wines such as uh, Sauvignon Blanc or an Albarino, a Riesling, a Chardonnay. And they're best used in recipes featuring eggs, potatoes, rice, pasta, cream, butter, and even tomatoes. So the white White truffles can stand up to tomatoes better than the black truffles. So if you're doing something like a pasta sauce uh, or a pizza and you want to grate truffles on top of your pizza, a white truffle is a good, <clears throat> a good choice for that. And of course, it's a good choice for an aioli or something that would ordinarily have a garlicky flavor anyway. So a tip for that is to shave uh, this truffle on top of your dish just before you serve it so that the, the flavor hasn't had a chance to, to migrate. Um, so with that, I'm going to take a little detour again and sing you a second Talking Blues about the cooking. So that maybe if this uh, sticks in your head, when you get to your kitchen, and I'll share with you some uh, sources for ordering truffles later, you can uh, give it a try yourself. So this is the other song. Got it. Okay. Well, if you want to cook with truffles, let me tell you what to do. Just forget about everything you ever knew. Pair down to the base. 
basics. That's the stuff. No need to try to show off all your fancy fluff. Use eggs and potatoes as your foil, rice and cream, pasta and oil. Don't forget to bring out the bacon fat and butter and grits and stuff like that. Stay clear of spice and pickles and fish. Things that detract from the star of the dish. If it's black, heat it gently. If it's white, leave it be. Grate it into taters or serve it up with brie. Think of sorghum and olives, chocolate and shallots. Pair with wines that match and balance. Say a prayer before you join into the trouble game because once you've had a taste you'll never be the same all right well that's enough of that foolishness um let's see i want to share with you a couple of associations that exist um, besides natca so i did mention natca earlier uh, that was started by Franklin and Betty Garland, who are in Hillsborough, North Carolina, and they also own a nursery. So if anybody is interested in buying truffle seedlings, you can contact the Garlands. Um, it's Garland Truffles. And there is also a wonderful nursery in the Northwest in Oregon that's owned by Charles Lefevre. And um, he of course, is in the area of the Oregon truffles, but he also does seedlings for tuber melanosporum and also for the, um, uh, the local truffle that is getting a lot of uh, accolades right now, the Appalachian truffle, um, which, let me see, I'm gonna look that up in this book for you so you can see a picture of that. Uh, I believe we've got this right here. Yeah, tuber canaliculatum. <laughs> I'm going to get to my tongue twisted here. Tuber canaliculatum, um, which looks like this right here. Uh, it's got a dark interior, but a kind of a red, almost a cinnamony exterior. And that that is something we've been experimenting with uh, in recent years. There's a grower up in Maryland who has, is, um, uh, has, has a sizable orchard and is waiting for a good harvest from that. Uh, there's a fellow up in Quebec, Jérôme Quirion, who uh, provides seedlings for that particular variety of truffle also. So I, yeah, I was gonna share with you a couple of more um, um, resources for truffle associations besides the besides NATCA, there's the Australian Truffle Growers Association, if anybody's dialing in from Australia, which I seriously doubt, but you never know. Uh, the great thing about uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, is that their truffles are available at the flip side of the year from the truffles that we have in the Western Hemisphere. So if you are um, hungry for a tuber uh, melanosporum in July, you can order truffles from Australia if you want to pay the price of the shipping. Uh, there's the British, uh, there's the BC, the British Columbia Truffles Association. There's the Idaho Truffle Growers Association. Uh, there are quite a few plantations out in Idaho. Napa Valley Truffle Association, New Zealand Truffle Growers Association, um, and the North American Truffling Society, as well as the North American Truffle Growers Association. Um, so truffle festivals, uh, of course, there is, as I, uh, Kathy mentioned earlier, the Asheville Truffle Experience, which will be coming up February 10th through 12th in Asheville, and that will be a combination of tasting experience, a little bit of education, a little bit of um, uh, cooking with truffles hands-on, and uh, we will also go out in an orchard with a dog and, and do a truffle hunt. So um, that's AshevilleTruffle.com if you want to look that up. There's also the Napa Truffle Festival, which I believe is taking place uh, in January this year. And there's the Oregon Truffle Festival, which is uh, generally early February, um, a bit in January and early February. That's run, or at least was started by Charlie Lefevre out in Oregon. And um, last year we had a Virginia Truffle Festival, the first one. I'm not certain whether that's happening this year or not, but uh, keep an ear out because that's something that may continue. So those are a few uh, places where you can go and get a really uh, quick intensive taste of what's going on in the truffle world, uh, taste a couple of different varieties and um, see what different chefs do with, with truffles because every chef has his own twist and turn and everybody has his own taste. So um, it's, it's fun to experiment with that a little bit. 
And then, of course, there are the dog trainers. Uh, Blackberry Farm out in uh, Tennessee, in Wallen, Wallen, Tennessee, is that right? Um, has, as a, a source for training truffle dogs. There's Canine Behavior Company. Uh, there's the Pacific Truffle Dogs. And then there's the Truffle Dog Company also in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and then as far as truffle products, if you're looking for truffle products, I want to mention that if you've had truffle oil and you didn't like it, there's a reason for that. <laughs> if you did like it, well, so much the better for your pocketbook. But generally speaking, if you've had truffle oil or other truffle products that you buy over the counter, like truffled nuts or even truffle salt often, it's uh, synthetic flavor that has been introduced uh, to uh, to a medium like olive oil um, and it's not representative of what a truffle is. So a truffle has maybe a hundred different volatile compounds and when you taste that it's just it, it's an explosion in the palate, it's an explosion in your mind, whereas um, truffle oil is generally just one of those compounds that's been isolated. So if you if you think about gumbo, if for anybody who likes gumbo uh, or has made gumbo, this is one recipe that uses a whole lot of ingredients. And generally, I like the simplest recipes, the simpler, the better. Um, I, I like to just use one or two or three ingredients so you can really taste what you're eating. But gumbo is that melting pot of a whole bunch of flavors that blend into each other. And if you t extract one of those ingredients, celery, for instance, and you give that to somebody and say, here, this is what gumbo tastes like, and you taste celery, and maybe you don't even like celery, that's what truffle oil is like. So <laughs> I encourage you, if truffle oil is all you've had, to uh, at some point in your life, treat yourself to a truffle. It's not necessarily as expensive as you think. If you buy, you know, you can buy yourself an ounce of truffle. So the truffles that I got from um, my friend, Michael Riggin, who's uh, in the east of the state also, he and his dog, Alora hunted those out. Uh, these were $45 an ounce, which I know it sounds like a lot, but an ounce can go a really, really long way. And if you treat yourself to an ounce of truffle once a year, you know, you might go out and buy a, a bottle of whiskey and it would cost that much. Um, so um, I think I think you can uh, you can justify buying a truffle every once in a while for for that uh, that uh, treat to yourself. Um, so many more things that I could uh, go into. Um, I, um, uh, but I want to I, I do want to open the ground a little bit to discussion because I know that there, there are some of you might have questions at this point. And Kathy, have there been any questions oh, yes. coming in? Oh, yes. And in fact, you just answered one and that was how much a truffle cost. Uh huh. <laughs> So again, it depends on the kind of truffle that you're buying. Uh, if it's a pecan truffle, it's going to be less than a Perigord truffle. If it is, oh, sure. uh, uh, if it is uh, the white truffle from Italy, uh, the Tuber magnatum, it's going to be super expensive. It might be twice as much as the Perigord truffle. So um, it, it's really all over the place. And it also depends on whether it's the beginning of the season or the end of the season, or whether it happens to be around the holidays, the prices will grow, go up. So do dogs and pigs have to be trained to hunt truffles? They do need to be trained, yes. Um, you know, maybe if they grew up, <laughs> if they grew up in a truffle orchard, it might happen naturally to them. But yeah, it is, it is, it is a, it, it is a skill. And there are, that's why uh, truffle dogs, uh, generally the, 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 the most prized truffle dog um, is the uh, Legato Romagnolo, which is a, uh, an Italian breed that looks like a poodle. It's kind of a water dog. Uh, and those are quite expensive at the outset. And of course, if they're trained already when you get them, they're quite expensive. But um, it's, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it to have, if you, if you have an orchard, you need to have that dog or else you can you can rent a dog, more or less. I mean, there there are there are people. My friend uh, Michael Riggin go and my friend Lois um, uh, Lois Martin, who lives in Tennessee, are two people that I know that go out into uh, orchards and hunt for other people. Uh, so they they go around with their dog and they provide that service. That's a possibility. But uh, you know, we all love our dogs, so a dog is not a bad animal to live with the rest of the year when you're not hunting for truffles too. By the way, people were delighted with your song and or songs and wanted to know if there was a recording somewhere. 
Ah, <laughs> well, I think that um, you're going to be replaying this on <laughs> on your <laughs> website, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's fine. They, uh, just, they just liked it so much. Oh, well, that's lovely. Actually, the second song, the, the one about cooking with truffles, is uh, available on YouTube at the moment, and I just posted that on the front page of the Asheville Truffle Experience website, so you can hear that one there. Oh, great. If you give me the link, I'll put it with with everything that's, you know, the this podcast and the uh, YouTube so everybody can go find it. Great. Uh, that's AshevilleTruffle.com. Oh, okay. That helps. Uh, can you put Oh, sorry. Are the delicious sounding recipes for truffles in your truffle book? Uh, yes, they, they are. are. I think all of the ones I mentioned are in the truffle book, plus a whole lot more. There are 150 recipes in that book. And I chose uh, I chose my very, very favorites from the years that I lived in France. Uh, I was in France for 20 years uh, traveling around, traveling around, eating my way around the hexagon. And so my so very favorite like... recipes that lent themselves well to being a vehicle for truffles that weren't too elaborate are the ones that are included in that book. And, and if you don't have a truffle, all of those recipes are doable without truffles as well. So they're just the truffle is just the of course, the icing on the cake, much more than that, <laughs> the truffle in the recipe. So what are the zone limitations for truffles? You know, like, I think this is for, for gardens and such, if you happen to know. Well, that is fluctuating a little as global warming is changing our planet, of course. There are truffles being grown, uh, not necessarily the Tuber Melanosporum, but the, the Burgundy truffles, which can grow in a slightly uh, colder climate. Um, those are being grown in some in England, some in Gotland in Sweden, and um, um, the farthest north in the U.S. I'm not quite sure. Well, of course, uh, um, they're, they are being grown in Oregon, but that has the Gulf Stream. Um, I mean, not the Gulf Stream. The, the is it the Humboldt Current that warms up the Oregon coast, as I recall. Uh, in any case. Depending on depending on your species, you can go farther north if you're if you're cultivating, say, a burgundy truffle. Cool. What's your recommendation for where to source and buy truffles? So there are various different places, and I ha do have an index in the back of the book that lists uh, kind of the obvious ones that everybody knows about. Um, some of them are more pricey than others. For instance, D'Artagnan, you know, D'Artagnan, as people will say. Um, oh, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's one source. Sabatino, uh, Urbani, those are the names that everybody knows, and they will be uh, a little bit higher price point, but they always have lots of truffles. Um, I have a friend, uh, Alex Tosca in Charlotte, who uh, brings truffles in, and he can ship you just one or two truffles. Um, Regalis Foods in uh, New York City, they, uh, they source good truffles. Um, Let's see who else. Um, well, Michael Riggin at the moment, who's out hunting with his dog, Alora, and probably Lois as well when she's out with her um, her dog. They uh, are good sources of locally grown truffles, as in American grown truffles, if uh, if they happen to um, ha hit, a, hit a good year. Because again, it's, it's a farming venture. So some years are good, some years are not good. Uh, if, the, if it's not wet at the right moment or if it's too dry at the right moment, the harvest might be, uh, might be really scarce. So it changes from year to year. What is the shelf life of a truffle? So that uh, changes a little bit depending on the truffle also. The Perigord truffle, um, 10 days is about ideal, but uh, you, if you can keep it in, if you keep it in the refrigerator and you wrap it in a, a, a dry cloth or a paper towel and you change that paper towel every couple of days to uh, wick away the moisture and keep it from molding, then you can keep it, you, sometimes you can keep it up for maybe a month. Uh, you might not want to. You might want to eat it before then because you risk getting a little bit of mold in there. But it it, it can it can last a while. But really, ideally, if you want to get the ultimate taste, you want to eat it within ten days. Um, a question. I'm not sure this is pot, but any potential for growing truffles, let's say in the Illinois area. 
That's probably too specific, I'm guessing. Um, this, uh, there are scientists who could answer that question better than I could. Uh, Tom Michaels could definitely answer that question. Uh, Charlie Lefevre could answer that question. Uh, I would think so. I would think Illinois would work. Idaho works. Right, right. Um, by the way, somebody noticed that you have a wood-fired stove. And they'd love to know about your stove in the background and what you like to cook on there. Okay, I'm just, I am just—I think you can't quite see the, the door. I'm just opening oh, yes. the oven door here and the fire door here. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is the wood stove that I cooked on most of most of my adult years until I lucked into uh, uh, a little fancier stove over there. Uh, so I have them right next to each other, and sometimes I fire them both up at once, and I've got this uh, ten foot long expanse of cooking uh, surface. So I love doing slow stews, something like a boeuf building on the on the wood stove in the winter time, you know, all those winter slow cooked dishes. Um, pancakes are wonderful on a wood stove too, because you can get the surface really hot. And the great thing about cooking on a wood stove is you can just move your your pan from w one uh, eye to the next and uh, you can change your temperature immediately and uh, you can warm your plates on it you can warm your toes on it uh, the cats don't even get up on it because they burn their paws so you can leave food on it too when it's uh, when it's uh, fired up uh, how might one know whether a truffle is not poisonous it's good to double check if you're in doubt, obviously, if you've bought it from a reliable source, then um, you should be in good shape. It's going to smell good. If it doesn't smell good, then don't eat it. <laughs> it's going to smell amazing. Of course, you know, some people don't like the smell of truffles, but um, then you then you want to give it to somebody else. Um, but I mean, I always think we have our senses for a reason. So if you're in doubt about something, smell it. If you don't like it, then ask questions. Uh, if you taste just a little bit of something and it's bitter, super, super bitter, then maybe you might, might want to um, hear those little alarm bells because bitterness is a taste that has been, that is uh, uh, to protect us from eating things that might be poisonous. Of course, there are things that we love to go to because we love that bitterness like hops and uh, um, things in the cabbage family. But uh, generally, yeah, use your instincts. And if, if in doubt, definitely get it checked up. And there are places, there, there are labs that, uh, that can analyze truffles if you're in doubt. Good to know. Uh, do, I, I, this is, I hope, an earnest question, but do ducks hunt truffles too? <laughs> That's the first time I've ever been asked that question. <laughs> oh, do ducks like truffles? I will... I will study on that. I will let you know next time we speak. I love that question. <laughs> so here's a question that might have to be answered by a future presenter, but nonetheless, I'll ask it. If you wanted to grow your own, what is the minimum number of trees to have a good chance of success? And can you hire a truffle dog to come in one or two times per season for a small farmer? I would say oh, yes. I mean, that. I, I would. I would say yes to the second part of that question, because I mean, the, unless you have a friend, you're gonna pay that uh, that person to come in in any case, and it doesn't matter how many trees you have, you might, you, you might have to pay the same <laughs> to somebody coming out with a dog because it's time on, and expertise on their part. Um, uh, and as far as the number of trees, that's a question I have, uh, I have asked a lot because uh, I am intending to plant an orchard and I have been holding back to sort of uh, watch everybody else's mistakes and learn from them. And I've gotten to the point where I live on a hillside at about 2,500, 3,000 feet, uh, lots of north facing slopes, lots of snow in the winter, and the Perigord truffle, while it is my favorite, it might not be the best truffle for me to grow. So I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of planting the Appalachian truffle. Um, and the number of trees, um, I think um, when I have asked that question of people who are in the know, two dozen perhaps, to have a little a, a network of mycelia, um, I would say two dozen is probably a good 
small number, but the more you plant, the, the, the larger your network will be and the more chance you have of, of getting, getting truffles um, spreading throughout your orchards, I would think. But I have not yet been on the other end of the truffle spade. So that is a question you could definitely ask uh, of the of NATCA, members of NATCA, the North American Truffle Growers Association. There are many, many growers there uh, who have had a lot of experience and who have tried different numbers. Um, a lot of folks who have planted orchards have planted large numbers, uh, partly I think because orchardists, um, people who are who have um, nurseries like to sell large numbers of trees and uh, they've kind of talked them into planting large numbers. Um, and uh, certainly if you have the wherewithal, go for it. It's an expensive venture and you may end up with the truffles that you planted. You may end up with uh, uh, a surprise um, uh, intruder that would change the nature of, the, the, of, of what you're going to produce. So for instance, if tuber bromali, <clears throat> excuse me, tuber bromali is a black truffle that is a lesser species that looks exactly like tuber melanosporum. And unless you test each truffle before you infect your uh, orchard with those truffles. If you get the wrong truffle, you might um, it might infect your entire orchard. That has happened Ooh. to people. So um, it's good to get your, your it's good to get your truffles checked if you're uh, in the well, planning well, business. You, you could lose your shirt. <laughs> you um, could. Have there been efforts to develop sensors for finding truffles so that dogs and pigs are not needed? I have heard of such things. Uh, I've not. I've not observed it. So, um, you know, who knows? Who knows? That, who knew that we would have cell phones and internet? Who knows what's going to happen next? That's true. Uh, there's a delightful little book, Truffle Hound, by Rowan Jacobson. Yes. It is tales about growing and hunting truffles around the world, as well as very funny ones about training truffle hounds. Yes. Yes, Rowan came down and we hunted truffles together a couple of years ago and shared some truffle eggnog. Um, so yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a really, really good storyteller. And he, uh, he went to a whole lot of hidden places in various different places in the world and described his experiences. So uh, his book is largely about the dog element. And um, yeah, so it's definitely a good read. Okay, we have some traditional information about truffle ducks. I was in Switzerland at a fancy restaurant and they utilized truffle ducks, but not all graduated successfully. Some ducks were too excited and couldn't just find the truffles for their master, but loved to eat them too. They then were forcefully retired. <laughs> well, I say if, you're, if your ducks eat your truffles, then you got to eat your ducks and hopefully they'll taste like truffles, right? <laughs> you can, you can, you can hope. Uh, that's very interesting. They said, I hear there's the same trouble with pigs because they like the truffles too. Yes, well, that's one of the reasons that people uh, tend to gravitate more towards the dog because the the pigs are very gourmet, and if you have a 200 pound pig bearing down on you, it's a little bit harder to knock him away than it is your dog. And plus, um during the 10 months of the year when you might not be hunting for truffles, um, dogs are a little bit easier to keep in the house. Oh, they're delightful. What happens when a truffle infects your orchard? Does it cause issues for the orchard trees? Sorry if this was answered. I, I may have missed this. I think she might have, but you kind of explained that. Does it, does it cause issues for the orchard's trees? Fact, Is that the yes. question? Well, yeah. if you are planting truffles, if you're planting a, a truffle orchard, you want your trees to be infected with truffles. If your trees are, if your tree roots are not infected with the truffle mycelium, you're not going to produce any truffles. Ah, okay. And I really enjoyed Truffle Underground by Ryan Jacobs. Yes, about that's truffle another. related crime. Yes, that's another one. <laughs> Okay, so I, I I think we're about finished with questions, but I will. Uh, so earlier today, I told Susie about this was back to 2004. I was gifted five black truffles from Oregon, 
and they arrived packed in rice. I know this because I found my post on the internet about this. Unfortunately, it didn't have a picture, but it said that they were black truffles. Um, I was really excited about them. I swear I never ate any of them because they had the strong smell of diesel fuel. I just couldn't get past that. So um, eventually they had mold and I could throw them away and not feel too <laughs> bad about it. And you didn't have any ducks to feed them to. <laughs> I, <laughs> that would have been something, right? That would have been so something. So you may have had one of the one of the white truffles that has that more petroly uh, flavor to begin with. Um, but I would caution you. Uh, I would I would caution anybody against uh, storing truffles in rice because rice wicks too much of the moisture out. Oh. You don't want to dry out your truffle. Uh, it used to be that that was advised, but now it's more advised to to wrap them in a dry cloth or a, a, a paper towel or something like that that you change frequently. Um, also, if uh, if you if you have them packed in rice and then you cook your rice, you're going to lose all of that flavor because it's just going to be it's just going to leach out. So you're, you're wasting your truffle flavor. Now, early on, uh, but by the way, uh, Carrie, she said that truffles help trees and the trees help trifles. That's a Michael Reisel relationship. Yes. Um, we 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 hear about it a lot in, in mushroom club at our various meetings over the years and it has to do like you could try to plant pine trees somewhere where they're not usually and they'll fail but you kind of sort of get some of that um the fungi related to it and suddenly they well i can't say suddenly but sometimes it works out you've got thriving pines where they might not have that, that's a gross relation gross um uh, thing but uh so i heard but i won't say i know who but i i only heard it as a rumor so i'm not going to reveal it and get myself into trouble but one of the earliest criticisms i heard years ago about truffle hunting was somebody from our club who you know and her she went on a truffle hunt and what got her upset was all of the raking around the roots Yes, well, that damages the roots. And uh, the, the thing about raking truffles, when, when the truffles are harvested by, by rake rather than uh, with a dog hunting them out, the dog knows when the truffle is ripe. But if you are raking them out, you're going to get unripe truffles along with ripe truffles. And I've heard of somebody in Oregon who purchased land and they have some trees that have truffles. And they regularly go in there and rake those roots and they collect stuff and then they put everything back. Of course, it's their tree so they can do what they want, but apparently not too much ill effect. Not that I, and by the way, by the guy, we have enough problems locally. Don't try this with a tree you find in the forest <laughs> preserve. We don't need we don't need that trouble. Well, maybe also if, if 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 this is Oregon truffles and they're growing natively and maybe there are enough that they're not really worried about the effect of raking. It's like ramps. I mean, uh, I live in a place that's rich in ramps and I'll go out and dig ramps and not worry about replacing the roots because there are so many of them. They're rampant. That's where the expression your, comes from. <laughs> they're but rampant. It's your, um, but it's your, prop, it's your property. Right. But, and they're happy when you thin them out. Um, but it depends on how many you have. Right. But in our case, uh, let's say in the Chicago area and the Collar counties, you go to the forest preserves, they don't want the ramp collecting they're not even that thrilled about the mushroom things. I mean, in fact, there's rules. And so we're like, we have to be careful how we behave or, you know, the fun is gone. <laughs> I'm not, somebody wants to cut, Matt wants to comment on that, but I'm just making sure we, we are not, I mean, I have friends, I know people, you know, they also have it with some some you know immigrant populations where there's certain plants that they see in the forest preserve and they want to go digging them up it's a big deal it's a big deal but anyway that's our sorrow so i'm sorry i haven't been paying attention to the chat but i did just see oh, one i've question been asking come. the questions for the chat uh, 
Okay. I did see one person who just wrote about the quality of truffles sold in brine. And of course, that's a, a way of preserving truffles. Um, but it's, it's not going to be the same as eating a fresh truffle. It's like uh, freezing a truffle is going to preserve it better than, um, better than preserving it in brine, I would think, to have a, a, a truer to truffle flavor. Um, but I, it, it, it might be that it would keep a little bit longer in brine in a jar. Um, but really, the best, the best thing to do is eat your truffles in season, eat a lot of them if you possibly can, and then, you know, wait till they come around again. It's like tomatoes, right? They're best when they're fresh off the vine. Absolutely. And by the way, it's 8.04, and I know you need to carry on with your life. So well, we're good. thank you I for coming today. I want to thank you. I want to thank you particularly. I want to thank the uh, Illinois Mycological Association and the uh, Chicago historians, uh, culinary historians. And I'd also like to thank uh, my publisher, Andrew Flack, who is here with from Hatherley Books, uh, because he took a chance on this book. And uh, he also took a chance on these books, which I'll just hold up for a second. This is Appalachian Appetite. Um, Child of the Woods, and the Chef's Book of Favorite Culinary Quotations. Um, these are a couple of other titles that you can pick up for your winter reading if you're interested. Um, I'd also like to thank Scott Warner for bringing me on board uh, with uh, the culinary historians a couple months back, and my dear friend John Warner, who did the sizzle reel for uh, the Truffle Festival this year, and uh, several of the photos that appear on that site. So uh, it was a pleasure speaking with all of you. I hope to see you at the Asheville Truffle Experience in February. And if you can't make that, I do foraging expeditions the last Saturday of every month on my farm in North Carolina. So we spend an afternoon and evening walking in through the woods, uh, gathering whatever is available. And of course, in March, that's when the morels and the ramps are starting to come out. April, that's continuing, rolling along. Uh, we come home and we do a, a couple hours of a cooking class, and then we sit around a table and eat a multi-course wine paired meal. So that goes through October, as long as the season is good for, for finding things in the woods and the fields. Um, and I'll also be doing a couple of uh, classes at Turtle Island coming up. Uh, um, in April, I'll be doing a foraging session there and a wine in the woods session. I'll also be doing a wine in the woods session here in conjunction with Eustace Conway from Turtle Island on April 1st. If anybody is in North Carolina and wants to come out, we'll be talking a little bit about the the, the various uh, correlations between woods elements and uh, uh, grapes and uh, the you know the 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 the, um, the granite flavor, the woodsy flavor, the piney flavors that uh, can be found in certain wines and uh, the terroir that creates that. Uh, can we indulge and ask a favor? Absolutely. Perhaps one more song before you go away. <laughs> Somebody asked for it. You know what? You, you really are great. Oh my! Um, you know just what? Just repeat I, the truffle song. It's good <laughs> what I'd like to do is pull out my fiddle, but that would take me away from you. Um, so, um, oh, go grab your fiddle. We can wait. Okay, pour a glass. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I follow her on uh, Facebook, and she does do public performances of her music. <laughs> so um, I set myself a task, which I have not yet carried out. Uh, by the next time I see you, I hope to have done so. Uh, I wanted to um, come up with a, a fiddle tune called the Truffle Shuffle. So that is in the making. But for the moment, we'll get out that instrument. So I was kind of born with a fiddle in my hand. My father was a square dance caller and uh, they came to these mountains from, from the north uh, in the early 60s before the back to the land movement was, uh, was a thing. And um, they wanted to live like the mountain people and 
have an outhouse, keep a cow, keep a garden. We grew everything we ate. We lived on $200 a year and we went to town twice a year. And meanwhile, we sat around the fire and played music. <laughs> you, you have a life that you just, you know, difficult to imagine today. <laughs> so just for a little bit of indulgence here, and the sound might saturate a little bit because I've noticed that Zoom doesn't pick up the fiddle as well as uh, some other microphones. Um, but this is a little bit of a, a, a food medley, a, a, a tune called Sally Gooden, a tune called Leather Britches. If anybody knows what Leather Britches is, if you've got green beans and you want to preserve them and you string them on a string and you hang them up above the fireplace to let them dry out. And then in the winter time, you throw them in a pot with salt back and, and rehydrate them and they taste delightful. Uh, and then a little bit of Uncle Joe at the end, which is an, uh, an Irish song. So this will get your toes tapping and uh, I'll lead you out with this. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. everybody as well. Thank you so much. I return you back to your life. <laughs> and my truffles. <laughs> yes. I promise will. not to eat them all tonight. Thank I you promise. all. Thank you See so you much. Again. Very good. Thank you.